Good morning. My name is uh, Bernard Firestone, and I am Dean of the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Donald J. Sutherland Lecture in Liberal Arts to be delivered by Senator Joe Lieberman. Before I turn the podium over to Professor Richard Himmelfarb, who will introduce Senator Lieberman, I'd like to acknowledge the late Mr. Donald J. Sutherland, who endowed this lecture. Don was a member of the Board of Trustees at Hofstra. He believed very strongly in the value of a liberal arts education. And he endowed this annual talk because in his view, exposure to speakers with a wide variety of experiences and opinions was fundamental to developing in students habits of critical thinking and openness to new ideas. Over the years, Sutherland speakers have included the biographer Robert Caro, historian Deborah Lipstadt, poet Robert Pinsky, and novelist Salman Rushdie, among many others. Although Don is no longer with us, I want to take this opportunity to recognize his family, and particularly his wife, Denise Sutherland, who regularly and faithfully attends these talks. Could you please stand? Once again, on behalf of Hofstra, welcome. And now I'd like to present Professor Richard Himmelfarb. Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Himmelfarb from the Political Science Department. And I have the privilege of helping to plan uh, the Sutherland Lecture every year with the help of some uh, very important people. Um, I'd like to thank um, those whose support and cooperation were essential for this event. They include um, the president of Hofstra University, Stuart Rabinowitz, the provost, Herman Berliner, Dean Bernie Firestone of HCLAS, and Melissa Connolly, who is uh, our vice president of university relations. Um, a number of other people have also proven indispensable to planning today's events, <clears throat> and they include Helene Morris um, of uh, HCLAS, and from University Relations, Jennifer Jocks, Carla Schuster, Ginny Greenberg, and um, of course, Colin Sullivan, uh, who made uh, yeoman efforts on behalf of this event. And finally, uh, special thanks to the Sutherland family, without whose generosity this event would not be possible. <clears throat> Our speaker today is a devoted public servant, a man of principle, and a patriot. From 1989 to 2012, Joe Lieberman was a four-term United States Senator from Connecticut. Of course, he is perhaps best known as the Democratic candidate for Vice President in 2000. Were it not for some hanging chads, and confusing butterfly ballots in Florida, he would have taken office with Al Gore, and history may well have unfolded quite differently. The topic of Senator Lieberman's speech today is the case for American engagement in a dangerous world. Few men are so well equipped to make this argument as our speaker. During his years in the United States Senate, Joe Lieberman was one of the nation's most influential voices on national security issues. He played a lead role in writing legislation creating the Department of Homeland Security to protect the nation against terrorism. He has been an outspoken advocate of the need to increase investment in national defense and transform our armed services to meet the threats of the 21st century. Most importantly, in an age where some advocate leading from behind, while others promote a gradual transition to isolationism, Senator Lieberman remains a strong and consistent advocate of using America's military might to defend the nation's interests and values where they are seriously endangered. It is an honor to welcome Senator Joseph Lieberman de Hofstra to present this year's Donald J. Sutherland Lecture. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Hibblefarb. 
Uh, Dean Firestone, it's an honor to be here. Uh, a special thanks to the Sutherland family, uh, who I was privileged to meet beforehand. This is a, a, a wonderful way for someone to perpetuate a value that he and you and, and his family uh, believed in. And I particularly love the emphasis on a liberal arts uh, education. I, I went to Yale. The president of Yale at that time was a man named Whitney Griswold. He was a great believer in the liberal arts. And I remember he said once that we don't exist to teach business to business people or grammar to grammarians. Uh, we uh, exist to teach them the liberal arts, teach them uh, the sum total of, uh, of knowledge as best we can of our civilization, and then they will apply that to whatever they do. I must say I was thinking that earlier, just a few moments ago, I spoke to some wonderful students here at Hofstra, and one of them asked me um, what they would, what I would counsel them to do to uh, get into politics. And I said, uh, the first answer I'd give you is not practical and maybe counterintuitive. Read history, read uh, biographies, read philosophy. Uh, prepare yourself uh, to, uh, to hold to seek and hopefully hold power in your society, and there's no better way than to learn from the lessons of history. So my thanks to the Sutherland family. I'm honored to be giving this Sutherland uh, lecture. Uh, I'm into my second year in uh, what one of my former Senate colleagues uh, called the afterlife. Uh, life after the Senate. It's, uh, I've always believed in the afterlife, and now it's a pleasure to <laughs> experience it here. And uh, one of the um, I had uh, I got a lot of advice from uh, people as I was retiring. Uh, I went to see some of my former colleagues. Uh, Fred Thompson, of course, now is known for being a great actor and incidentally selling reverse mortgages, as <laughs> you may have seen. Uh, he said to me, I, if, I, uh, if I have the courage, I'll try the, Texas, the Tennessee draw. Well, Joe, he said, uh, my first year out of the Senate, I got involved in some really interesting things. My second year out, I try to get out of most of those really interesting things. So, and but he obviously found a place he's, he's happy. Uh, I've, I've had um, a wonderful first year out, um, uh, going back to the law, which has been my career, but also uh, but doing it half time and leaving time for other pursuits, including uh, teaching and, and lecturing of this kind, which I enjoy doing, and I also feel in some sense that I'm trying to give back, well, two things, really. One, I'm trying to give back for all the uh, people who taught me and helped me uh, to form my opinions along the way, but also, frankly, to uh, find a way to apply um, my own experiences and what I learned and, and to stay uh, involved uh, outside of the Senate. So thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to address the topic, the case for American engagement in a dangerous world. I'll, I'll give some remarks and then I'll be happy to uh, try to answer some questions. I thought I would begin to address the subject by contrasting uh, your uh, student generation, that is the generation of students at Hofstra today, with mine, both the, um, the world that I and you grew up in, and also uh, the leadership influences uh, on our lives, because inevitably um, that has an effect on our attitudes towards uh, questions like America's engagement in the world. So um, just to show what a, a dinosaur I am, I was actually born during World War II. I was, of course, it was late in World War II. Um, but what that meant is, as I look back, that as I came of age, and you know my first political memory is the election of 1952. Um, I'm with my mother and father and my grandmother who uh, lived with us, my mother's mom, and we're watching the returns coming on on TV. The two candidates are General Eisenhower and uh, Governor Stevenson. Uh, and um, my grandmother and I are, of course, for Eisenhower. I mean, he, he won the war. He defeated 
you know, the Nazis. And uh, I can't understand why my mother and father are going for this guy, Stevenson. Uh, there you were. Uh, and later I understood. <laughs> but the, the reality was that I grew up with a sense, as I came of age really more during the 50s and 60s, of um, America as the, the protector and the leader in the world, as, uh, as the country that uh, had the courage and, and principle to enter the Second World War with our allies in Europe and Asia to defeat Nazism and uh, fascism. And then uh, as, as the uh, 50s went on and to the 60s to uh, see succeeding presidents of both parties, generally supported by members of the opposite party in Congress, lead America in the Cold War which was, yes, in one sense, a, a, a conflict of two great powers, but also really a conflict of ideologies, of, of values, of, of freedom uh, versus authoritarian government. I entered college in the fall that John F. Kennedy was elected president. And that had an enormous effect on me and, um, hundreds of thousands, millions of others of uh, my generation. Uh, I really think that that presidency, and particularly the inaugural address, if I had to single out one thing among many, was probably the, the transformative moment that led me to start thinking about a career in public service. And of course, the overall theme, you remember, was ask not uh, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. But uh, Kennedy was uh, a, um, a, a, pr a proactive internationalist. Let me just read you a few lines from his inaugural address. Americans have always believed that the rights of man come from the hand of God. It goes right back to the Declaration of Independence. And then Kennedy pledged that, the world, that he would, as president, never stand by and permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed. Uh, and, and then in, in a rallying cry that echoed certainly through my generation, maybe beyond, with particular reference to the Cold War, but more than that, we will pay any price and bear any burden to assure the sustenance and survival of liberty. So here, here was a um, remarkably principled statement of um, American foreign policy and of American uh, internationalism. And it affected um, me and a lot of others of my generation. Uh, the college generation that's at Hofstra now uh, came into the world at a, at a very different time. Born uh, in the early 90s through the um, mid 90s, generally speaking, uh, growing up after the great conflict of the Cold War was over, um, I'm not sure feeling the same exact kind of pride that we did growing up about America's role in ending uh, the Second World War as uh, um, when it came to the end of the uh, Cold War. Um, President Clinton in the 1990s actually carried out a pretty internationalist foreign policy. Most of the students here today were really quite young then and probably don't remember that President Clinton took us uh, into the Balkans to stop genocide, in that case against Muslims there, and then also uh, militarily acted in Kosovo to stop uh, the Serbs from uh, aggression there to make the statement that in post-Cold War Europe we would not stand by and allow ethnic uh, rivalries to create a conflict and at worst uh, genocide. Probably the, 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 the international event that this student generation, um, I would guess, most remembers is 9-11. Uh, still, you were young, but um, it was a, a, a traumatic event for everybody who was of any age at that uh, point. Um, the world crashed in on all of us. We were struck here at home in a way that we had not been 
uh, before, at least not since the British invaded way back in the early part of the 19th century, uh, we were struck from far away. And, and quite naturally, one would think that that would lead to an era of internationalism and understanding how close the world was tied together and how we could be affected uh, from enemy sources far away. And it did. Um, it's, it's hard to remember now, but um, the war in Afghanistan in response to 9-11 and the war in Iraq also in some sense in response to 9-11 both enjoyed um, significant public support and um, uh, support, uh, broad support in Congress. Certainly f at the, uh, their initiation uh, and as uh, we achieved initial victories, both overthrowing the Taliban in Afghanistan and overthrowing Saddam Hussein in Iraq. But as we all know, those wars um, didn't end uh, easily or quickly. Um, we've, we proved ourselves to be less able once victory was achieved to sustain the emergence of uh, a new uh, government. And um, the public really turned here in America against um, both of those wars and inevitably uh, as has happened in the past in American history when uh, wars have been unpopular the public has tended to uh, turn away. Uh, earlier this morning I spoke to another group here on campus and I, I quoted a, um, um, a line from Mark Twain which um, my running mate in 2000 used to quote Al Gore which was Twain once said that um, when a cat jumps up on a stove and the stove is hot, the cat screams and jumps off the stove and never jumps on the stove again, even though most of the time it's not hot. Um, we presumably are uh, smarter than the cat, although cats are pretty smart. And um, the, the, the comparison here, of course, is that there are times when we have to get involved, times when involvement doesn't work, and other times um, when, when uh, it's not the way it was before and we have to have the vision and the, the responsibility uh, to get involved. Um, we're still finding our way post-Iraq, post-Afghanistan to that moment. This generation of students uh, has not had a national leader that has summoned them to the same kind of international uh, activity and involvement as uh, my generation did. To some extent, President Bush tried, but when the war in Iraq went sour, his own credibility to do that uh, diminished. President Obama, who is not an isolationist by any means, um, but has approached since the 2008 campaign foreign policy in a, in a very different fashion, which was essentially to uh, promise that he would get America out of Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, keep us out of such conflicts uh, during uh, his presidency. And this leads to the kind of policy statements that Professor Himmelfarb uh, referred to about leading from behind, a, a general reluctance uh, to be engaged uh, in, uh, in, in activities beyond us, beyond uh, the U.S. The President has in fact kept those promises in doing so. Uh, I think he's not only reflected but encouraged the current popular desire for retrenchment from the world that makes the question that you have asked me to answer so relevant, which is what is the case for American engagement uh, in a dangerous world? Uh, just to back up the reality of this, I was struck by a recent poll sponsored by the nonpartisan Pew Trust, which found that a majority of the American people agreed with the statement that what happens in the, the rest of the world is none of our business. Um, that's, a, that's an alarming uh, conclusion. Uh, we have flirted over our history, as I suggested before, with moments quite like this, but they almost always end in trouble uh, for us. We are almost always drawn into international conflict uh, later than we should have been involved 
and ultimately at a cost in life and treasure that is uh, much greater than if we had stayed uh, engaged. In one sense, the current popular mood is understandable uh, for the reasons um, that I've stated. Two unpopular wars and tough economic times, we've experienced both of those. But I must say in another sense, the current mood to me is puzzling because the world is so self-evidently uh, smaller and more in interconnected than uh, it ever has been by the internet, uh, by, by the network, vast network of instantaneous uh, global communications, by the growing ease of world travel. This generation of students has traveled much more by this stage of their life around the world than my generation did, and that's a wonderful thing, by an obviously global economy, which is an economy uh, intimately uh, interconnected. There can be a, a problem, as we saw in recent times, uh, in, with the economies in Greece or, or Portugal, and a concern that uh, if those problems are not dealt with, they will have a dramatic effect on the uh, American economy. Uh, we're so interconnected with, the, with China that uh, uh, sometimes we fear it, and then at other times we worry that its economy is um, fragile, and should it uh, uh, slide uh, down, that, that we will um, be affected. And then, of course, uh, as I, I said before in 9-11, we saw um, how small the world is because we suffered uh, from the capacity of a very small group of violent extremists based in a lawless land a world away to strike and kill uh, 3,000 of, of us here in America. So I, I, this, um, I, I, I understand and yet I'm puzzled and, and I do want to come back and, and uh, make the case for uh, engagement and, and essentially to argue that um, beyond the, the understandable emotions of the moment, which are not only felt among the American people, but you can see in Washington, not just from the White House, but from Congress, and not from one party alone, but from parts of both parties. I really want to make the case that our security, our prosperity, and our freedom demand that we stay actively involved in the world. In other words, that the choice that some pose between nation building here at home and so-called nation building in the world may, may get a round of applause, but it really is a false choice. We cannot be, in my opinion, secure, prosperous, and free at home if we are not protecting our interests and supporting our values in the world. We're just too uh, interconnected. Uh, let me begin with security, because the first responsibility of our national government is, as it says in our founding documents, to provide for the common defense. That is, to keep our country and our people safe. No other level of government can do that. America today, are we there? America, oh, okay. Just checking to make sure you were awake. Okay. America uh, today obviously um, exists in a dangerous world, a world in which we have a, a host of enemies from the violent Islamist extremists who still um, plot uh, and uh, act uh, to attack us and our allies, uh, to the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard and the radical government that uh, controls that country, to the fanatics who control uh, North Korea. Th those, are, um, those are real threats. But we also face uh, challenges that I, I put in a different category but are nonetheless real and depend upon uh, American engagement and uh, strength. And I include here, particularly uh, uh, based on events of the last couple of months, a resurgent Russia and uh, an assertive China asserting uh, claims to uh, uh, land and, and sea rights that are very threatening uh, to our allies uh, in the Asia Pacific, but also to us because we depend upon that region so much uh, for our own uh, economic uh, vitality. 
we have allies and friends around the world who we depend on. These alliances are important to us, our security and our prosperity, but they feel threatened today by expansionist powers in their neighborhoods, particularly in the Middle East and Asia, particularly uh, Iran and China. I must say that um, after all the years I, I was involved in foreign policy and security policy in Washington, it seemed to me increasingly that, that international relations are very much like personal relations in very many ways. Um, if you're not loyal to your friends, they will not be loyal to you. Uh, if you uh, show weakness in a, in a uh, conflict, uh, people will watch it and uh, see that and take advantage of you uh, in the next conflict. Um, so my point is we, we simply can't defend against these threats that I've described and challenges to ourselves and our allies by standing back, by cutting our defenses, by uh, leading from behind, by withdrawing from global leadership. If we do, our enemies will be emboldened to challenge us uh, as they already have been. Our allies uh, will be frightened into accommodating themselves to their regional antagonists, which they really don't want to do, and the world in America will be much less secure. I know it has become a popular promise of American politicians uh, that America cannot be the policeman of the world. But honestly, if we're not on guard, who will be? And we don't just do it for the world, we do it for ourselves. Who, who will uh, take our place? Um, the United Nations, China, Russia, Iran, even um, friendlier countries in the world like Europe, are they prepared alone to play the leadership role that this country is uniquely capable of playing? I, I don't think so. I prefer uh, to rely as much as possible on ourselves to protect ourselves but not to rely only on ourselves. So my uh, proposal would be that we not be the policeman of the world, but we be the police chief of the world, uh, which is to say that we organize uh, the defense of uh, stability uh, and uh, uh, freedom, but we not be expected uh, to do it all uh, ourselves. That, that kind of presence is necessary to secure both our own country and the global commons from the thugs and bullies who just by human nature will take advantage of a vacuum if we lead it. Recently, uh, Prince Turki Al Faisal of, the, of Saudi Arabia, who was a former ambassador to the United States and a former chief of Saudi intelligence used a very different metaphor uh, from the policeman of the world metaphor, and it may be um, uh, a more marketable metaphor. Uh, he said, in the Middle East today, the wolves are threatening the sheep, and there is no shepherd to protect the sheep. It may be that America um, will accept with uh, more ease the idea uh, of becoming, again, uh, the shepherd of the world. Secondly, um, we need to be engaged in the world to support our own economic growth and standard of living. And this is something that I really think that our leaders, and I include myself, have not done enough uh, to um, convince the American people of. Um, the, the fact is that there is a clear and compelling connection between a, an engaged internationalist foreign policy and a strong security presence around the world and our own prosperity uh, here at home. The worldwide presence of the American military has played an indispensable role in the extraordinary growth of the American economy and the global economy over the seven decades since the end of World War II, which were turning point 
uh, particularly in Europe and uh, the Middle East, uh, and, a and Asia, excuse me. Without stability, the fact is there never would have been the investments, the vast investments that have been made that have uh, led to such a rising tide of prosperity in our country and around the world. The miraculous economic growth in the Asia Pacific, particularly, could simply not have happened without the United States Navy guaranteeing the safe passage of maritime commerce through the waters of the Asia Pacific. That uh, commerce has quite remarkably raised hundreds of millions of Asians, maybe uh, up to a billion, out of poverty in those uh, decades. If you visit countries like uh, South Korea or, or Taiwan, of course Japan, but even now the, the new rising tigers of Asia like uh, Vietnam and uh, Thailand, etc., cetera, uh, you, you see the remarkable change that, that uh, has occurred, but it's also created uh, booming new markets for American goods and services that in turn have sustained and created millions of jobs uh, in America. Finally, um, our national values require us to be involved in global leadership. I go back uh, to the Declaration of Independence where our, our founders gave us a national purpose, a mission. They said that they were forming their new government in order to secure the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which were the endowment of our creator to every person, um, in that case in America. But um, that's clearly a declaration of universal human rights, because uh, I don't think anybody could successfully argue that the good Lord only gave those inalienable rights uh, to Americans. As a result, uh, America is always stronger when we put human rights at the center of our foreign policy. We, we live in an imperfect world, and we don't always apply that standard uh, perfectly, but when we do, we are clearly uh, not only serving our national values, but um, uh, protecting ourselves, whether uh, when we uh, stand with fighters for freedom as we did in the former Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War or today in places like Ukraine uh, and uh, Myanmar and beyond. I, I make this argument not just because uh, truly free countries are much less likely to be antagonists of ours, uh, enemies, but also because expanding freedom's reach is our national responsibility and our national destiny. And when we are consistent um, with those values, I think the American people understandably feel better, uh, feel prouder, uh, feel that they're part of a country um, that's the best in the world. Uh, now, is it possible to rebuild an understanding among the American people that America's global leadership is in their interest? Yes, it is but it will take leadership. Leadership in advocacy uh, as well as in action. It has to begin in the White House, then in Congress, and then uh, among the American people, particularly among those who choose to be leaders uh, in their own right, uh, in um, uh, leadership segments of our uh, society, including universities. Uh, I want to uh, uh, draw from uh, Robert Kagan of the Brookings Institute, um, who recently uh, had what I think is a fascinating, relevant, and in its way, encouraging insight about the, um, the capacity of America to return to uh, not a, a, a limitless expansionist uh, international policy, but a recognition of how important it is to be engaged uh, in a dangerous world. Um, Kagan observed that uh, President Obama's foreign policy 
of uh, standing back and, and trying not to uh, be too engaged in the world certainly seems from the public opinion polls to be exactly what the American people want. Um, but the fascinating inconsistency is, notwithstanding the fact that the president has stayed out of a series of conflicts, Syria, etc., uh, the public nonetheless, Kagan points out, gives the president very low marks on his foreign policy. In other words, <laughs> He, the president is doing what the American people say they want him to do in foreign policy, but they're ultimately not happy uh, that he's doing it. Let me be specific. The most recent uh, CBS News poll says that only 36% of Americans approve of President Obama's handling of foreign policy, and 49% disapprove. In fact, more Americans approve of the president's policies on the economy and health care, as controversial as that is, than they do on foreign policy. Well, how could that be? Uh, I'm going to hazard a guess, which is that though the American people are war-weary and in that sense skeptical of too much foreign involvement, I think they also know intuitively that if the United States is not respected in the world, trusted by our allies, and feared by our enemies, it is bad for each and uh, every American. And I think there's something else that I talked about earlier. Um, the American people really generally by their nature feel very good about being Americans, very blessed to be Americans, very grateful for the opportunities that they've had, and, and feel that we're part of a, of a unique uh, experience in the history of governance. In short, the American people want to be proud of America's leadership in the world. I, I think they're looking for a balance. They, they don't want us engaged in every fight but they understand the consequences of standing back. Uh, I, I'll just give you one experience from history and then an insight um, from today. I mentioned earlier that in the 90s, uh, President Clinton uh, led the US and NATO into Bosnia to stop the genocide and into Kosovo to stop the aggression. The public opinion polling on both of those in America was negative that is, before he took action, more Americans said they were against us getting involved. And there was another time, the end of the Cold War, oh, let's take a break, we've had enough already, the economy was not so good in the early 90s. And yet, after the president uh, took action in both of those, his popularity went up. And um, his, um, the, the ratings of, of him as a leader in foreign policy went up. I think for just the, the reasons, a bit puzzling, perhaps inconsistent, but you know, we hold a range of views and I think ultimately people felt proud of what he had done. Not so long ago, as you remember, uh, President Obama drew a red line with regard to Syria and said that if President Assad of Syria used chemical weapons, that then uh, he would get involved. and. Um, Secretary Kerry went out on that Friday afternoon, made, I think, one of the great speeches of his really distinguished career, um, seeming in some sense very compelling, very eloquent, almost an indictment of Assad, seeming really to set the table for um, President Obama to go out the next day and announce a limited military uh, action against Syria. Uh, President's changed his mind, um, as we know. Uh, that's had real consequences around the world in terms of uh, the reliance among our allies in the U.S. Uh, to come to their assistance or to keep its word uh, internationally. But I believe that if President Obama had gone ahead with the airstrikes on Syria, that he promised if the Syrians crossed his red line by using chem chemical weapons, his popularity like President Clinton's, among the American people would have shot up. 
uh, they would have admired his principle, his guts, and been proud that though, though really people in this country don't want to get deeply engaged, certainly not on the ground in Syria, would have been proud that the president had put America's muscle behind a principle which was uh, to, against uh, the use of chemical weapons. President Obama's desire to stay out of international entanglements has run into harsh realities in Syria and more recently with the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine and seizure of uh, the Crimea. And um, in some sense, this reminds us, I, I had a conversation with somebody a while ago, this was a year ago actually, and I was saying, uh, I'm thinking, uh, from President Obama's uh, point of view, thinking about his legacy. He's just been reelected. The Congress is paralyzed by partisanship. The prospects of the president being able to achieve major domestic uh, legislation in the remainder of his presidency is seriously in doubt. And so I said to this friend of mine, I, I wonder whether the president's going to at some point soon see that the one area where he has some uh, personal authority is his role as commander in chief and not that he'll go off on, on reckless excursions but that he will become more forceful and more engaged in the world and my uh, friend said to me uh, you misunderstand the, the president really he argued has uh, already decided what his legacy is which is that he, he got us out of Iraq and Afghanistan and he did not get us uh, mixed up in a lot of other troublesome spots in the world. But the reality is that even if you're president of the United States, your, your narrative, your vision of your role uh, is not controlling on the events of history. And so Syria happens and now um, Ukraine happens. The president is a very smart man. Um, and he is a person of vision, and, uh, I, and he has three and a half really important years uh, left in his um, presidency. I guess we're at uh, two and a half now. And um, I um, hope and pray that he will, uh, he will see, as I said, that not even a president can bend the world exactly to his vision, that there are consequences, that, that his vision is not working now to protect uh, our security and uh, our prosperity. Um, the president really is at a time when he can and I hope will adjust his policies internationally uh, to the reality of the world as he finds it. I hope the same is true of my former colleagues in both parties, in both uh, houses of Congress, because only then will America uh, be as secure and prosperous and free as I know most Americans want it to be. Thank you very, very much. Well, I am happy to answer some questions for a while. Yes, sir. Yeah, a comment on Jonathan Pollard, right? Yeah, so um, let's see if I can do this briefly. And it's a long story, my own history in this. Um, when I got to the Senate in the late 80s, early 90s, I was approached by a lot of people urging me to advocate for Pollard's release. And I got uh, some classified briefings from the intelligence community and really concluded that uh, Pollard had, had rightly been convicted because he had committed some serious crimes against the United States. I mean, uh, I hate to use the word traitor, but that's what he was. Um, I, and that's the position I maintained over the years. I had a personal position in the Senate that I, that I uh, wouldn't get involved in cases in the courts either while cases were being tried during sentence or, sentencing or aftering because I thought that was not the branch of government that I was in and I didn't want to, um, honestly, people would ask me to get involved in judicial cases, not because they didn't have a good lawyer, but they thought somehow having a senator write a letter might affect the judge or pardons board, or in this case, the president. Um, I'm out of the Senate now, and um, 
you know, I've been following this case, and the truth is that uh, Pollard has served a very long time. And uh, he's eligible, I think, for uh, actual um, release. Uh, the terms always confuse me. I think parole next year. Uh, what's being asked of him, what's asked of the president, is that he pardon um, uh, Pollard before then. Uh, he's also apparently in um, bad health. And uh, I think, um, though he committed these serious crimes, he served. I gather more than anyone else who has been convicted of this kind of uh, crime against the United States. So I, I think it's justified to release him now. I must say that when people ask me over the years to sign these letters, and you know, there's been a remarkably growing chorus about um, releasing Pollard that goes, it's quite bipartisan now. George Schultz, John McCain issued a public statement last year calling for Pollard's release, and I, said that I thought he would only be released prematurely, that is before he was formally eligible uh, for uh, parole um, as part of some kind of understanding between the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, and um, as you know, this has come up in recent days about the uh, a, a way to keep the, the uh, uh, Israel-Palestinian uh, peace talks going. Uh, it seems to have had a negative effect, that, that he shouldn't be bargained as part of this. I mean, that's, that's up to the parties. But anyway, that's a long story to say that I personally think it's justified to release him now because he's paid his price. Yes? Pardon? Did somebody say something? Oh, oh. We're actually going to be using a mic for the Q&A, so raise your hand and we'll be bringing the mic to you. We have a question right okay, here we, first. Uh, all right, I think I called on her, and then I'll come right over to you, sir. Go could, ahead. Could you please comment on the role of drone warfare and cyber warfare in dealing with our enemies? Yeah, so we're, we're into, a, obviously, a whole new technological chapter of uh, warfare um, you know, this is another lesson that history teaches you, that if you go back, almost without exception, uh, breakthroughs in industrially, technologically, have almost always been applied to warfare. It's just, unfortunately, the story of human history. I mean, I'm going back to the discovery of fire, or the um, uh, use of the ability to send telegraphic messages, uh, obviously airplanes, etc. Uh, so this remarkable breakthrough in our time of um, particularly the uh, internet uh, has also now been applied to uh, warfare. So um, th these are, this, this is a big subject, so I have to think of how best to uh, answer it. Um, I spent a lot of time the last couple of years, last four years in the Senate, trying to pass uh, cybersecurity legislation because we are unbelievably dependent on systems that are controlled by uh, the internet, by, by cyber systems. 85% um, of infrastructure in America is owned by the private sector. And of course, that's part of the greatness of our country. But that means that we, we have to rely on the private sector that runs the financial system, the communication system, the, the electric grid, uh, even water reservoirs. I mean, I could go on and on. Energy, um, movement of oil and gas to uh, protect themselves and us from cyber attack because in all of those big systems that I just described are controlled by internet and as a result they are uh, vulnerable to cyber attack. Uh, and a lot, of the a lot of the companies that control it are, do are doing a pretty good job at defending it. Frankly, a lot are not. So unfortunately, uh, we got stuck in ideological and partisan combat uh, and it didn't pass. President Obama, I thought rightly last year, issued an executive order to try to achieve some of what we want to achieve. But I must tell you that on the other hand, America has developed a, a very sophisticated capacity for cyber warfare. And um, increasingly, uh, I think when we get into conflicts, um, we will 
be using our offensive cyber warfare capacity. For instance, if we, uh, if we ever um, take military action against Iran, I'm sure some of it will, it will never be on the ground, I mean, the ground forces. Some of it will be um, uh, airstrikes, uh, uh, and perhaps some of them will be drone strikes. But I bet we try to incapacitate part of their defenses um, by uh, cyber attack. So this is the world in which we live. Our defenses are not as good as our offenses here. And um, we have a lot of work uh, to do to try to improve that. I hope I was responsive to your question. Yes, sir. Uh, to what extent would it be fair to hold President Bush liable for our drift into isolationism at this time. We went to war in Iraq, and as it turns out, forgetting the reasons we went, right. we went with a military that was not fully prepared. And since we were not attacked, we were the ones who chose when to start the war. Why was our military not in proper shape to do a professional job by going in unprofessionally right. as we did. It set the whole tone in the country that we made a mistake, we don't know what we're doing, and because of that we should really pull out because people will take advantage of our shortcomings. And I cannot understand if the man, when I say the man, I mean the government at the time right. that he was president did not take more of an opportunity to prepare himself properly to do a fully professional job in executing that war. Okay, good question. Let, let me just make a comment first. Um, something I observed over my time. In, in many cases, uh, the foreign policy of a president is actually different than they suggest it will be during uh, the campaign for the presidency. And it's very often defined by the foreign policy of the previous president. Uh, so what am I saying? You may remember that um, when uh, President Bush, Governor Bush, ran for the presidency in 2000, um, and I was there, so I do remember this, uh, he, he um, I think with, well, no, undoubtedly, with uh, the, the uh, events that uh, President Clinton had been involved in in Kosovo and Bosnia, he campaigned for a more humble American foreign policy, uh, more restrained. Now, all that changed after 9-11. Uh, and um, ironically, just to go back to your first statement, he became... Uh, quite uh, uh, an, an active internationalist president. Ironically, some of the, as, as I've said, uh, some of the uh, negative turns to involvement, particularly in Iraq, is part of why uh, we're fighting a, a sort of anti-internationalism mood in the Congress, in the White House, and among the American people now. So I would slightly, I, would differ, I think I would disagree with you on what you said about Iraq, not about its unpopularity. I think we did, um, we were successful militarily. In other words, we, um, in the initial goal, which was uh, to overthrow Saddam Hussein, what we were not prepared for, and I, maybe this is what you mean, uh, for what to do after that, how to, um, how to secure the country, how to assist the Iraqis to stand up their own government, their own military. And um, we made some terrible mistakes uh, after Saddam Hussein um, was overthrown, and, and uh, uh, we're paying for them still today. Next question. There's one down here. There's a lady here. And then I'll go over there. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Would we have gone into Iraq if we had known that Hussein did not have the bomb? Um, if we knew it for a certainty, probably not. I mean, I, who's to say? I, I can't, it's hard to look back. 
But there's no question. I mean, look, the, you all remember that the mood then, generally in the country, I mean, we were traumatized by 9-11. Uh, it, was, it was so shocking. I mean, I'll never forget uh, one of the most... One of the most powerful lines in the 9-11 Commission report was that 9-11 uh, had happened because of a failure of imagination. And, and then the authors, Governor uh, Keene and, and Congressman Hamilton, said that what they meant was our failure as a government, as a people, to imagine that a group would... Um, try in this way and succeed at attacking us. So uh, there was a lot of um, both fear and guilt around, fear that it would happen again, and a guilt in the government that we had not been uh, prepared for it. And so there was a feeling that Saddam was clearly our enemy. We knew that he was engaged with terrorists who were anti-American. Um, there was reason to believe, and of course uh, we never found them, so we assume we found a, an infrastructure of chemical weapons, particularly biological and chemical. We found some scientists who knew about nuclear weapons, but really not much. Later, um, there was a report done, um, independent report for the United Nations, I guess, which said that Saddam had told all the people around him that he was trying to break out of sanctions and his most significant goal was to develop nuclear weapons because he thought that would be the way to establish Iraq as a power. But he didn't obviously have a nuclear weapon at that time. So I would say uh, that the answer, I can't know, but probably not. Uh, probably we wouldn't have gone into Iraq. There wouldn't have been the support uh, for it. And, and at that time, there was actually overwhelming bipartisan support in Congress in both houses for the so-called resolution authorizing the use of military force uh, in Iraq. You know, a lot of times people will say to me, what do you think would have been different if Al Gore and you had been elected? And Professor Hemelfarb was, uh, said that. So I, s I always say, and again, I say, how, do, how really, I can't say for sure. Besides, I would have only been vice president. I mean, you know, vice presidents. But um, my feeling is that anybody who was president after 9-11 um, uh, would have gone into Afghanistan because that's the place from which the attack came. I would guess that um, uh, a President Gore would not have gone into Iraq. So in that sense, there would have been a significant difference. I mean, there's a lot of other differences. He would have done something about climate change. He, he wouldn't have, uh, uh, I don't think there would have been deficits as large. Would you like to hear my campaign speech from 2000? <laughs> okay. Yes, over here. Thank you, Senator Lieberman, for coming today. Um, I just want to ask you, first start off your speech talking about how being politically engaged you have to read. What books have influenced you? Oh, that's interesting. That's a great question. So, um, I'll start with one that I quoted at breakfast because I haven't thought about it for a while, but it's a novel, uh, All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren. It's a great novel about American politics. In this case, it's about... Um, Really, it's about Huey Long of Louisiana, but it, it's about a mythical or a fictional character named Willie Stark. But really, the books that have probably influenced me more were um, biographies. So biographies of Teddy Roosevelt. I was always quite drawn to him. Of uh, President Truman. Um, Winston Churchill is a great hero for me and most everybody. And part of it was that he, he saw the dangers coming in Europe in the 30s when others didn't. He put his neck on the line uh, to, to articulate all of that. And of course, um, he was right. And uh, ultimately, um, the, his country turned to him to lead them against uh, uh, the Nazis. Uh, of course, the other lesson that he taught me, particularly once when I lost an election, uh, he's the hero who led the country to victory in the Second World War, and a few months after, he loses uh, his campaign for re-election. So, you know, the, those things uh, happen. So those, now, in our time, more recently, 
Um, the Robert, I'm glad that Robert Caro, I guess, spoke in the Sutherland Lecture Series. Robert Caro's uh, books on Lyndon Johnson are really uh, phenomenal. They are really instructive. I said at breakfast, I'll repeat it here, this is an unpaid-for uh, advertisement. Uh, my wife and I recently uh, saw the Broadway play All the Way about Lyndon Johnson, starring Brian Cranston of uh, Breaking Bad. A remarkable performance, but the play is ex extremely instructive because, I mean, it shows Johnson in all of his uh, neuroses, but also in all of his greatness. And uh, it's all about the Civil Rights Acts of the 60s. And um, just the way in which, you know, he was, he, he was a creature of the Congress. He knew everybody. And watching his, this portrayal of him in a good cause, um, which you get in the book too, uh, Carol's book, The Cause of Civil Rights, um, uh, cajoling senators and um, uh, threatening them, frankly, lying to them if it was necessary, <laughs> I'm really quite remarkable, but ultimately bringing together the votes that were necessary to make this extraordinary change. So uh, also in our time, there have been some, I mean, David McCullough has written some great books about Truman, for instance, and um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And then there's a whole series of books by people, John Meacham and others, about the founding generation of Americans. So there's a lot to read. Yeah, uh, what did I say? Who's, you can, well, let's just move around the room. Over there is good. Um, can you talk about the U.S.'s stance on the protection of Israel and what it would take to truly have peace between Israel and its aggressors? Yeah, so the, the um, U.S.-Israel relationship remains a very strong one. I mean, we're tied, this goes back to 48 uh, when, when um, uh, the, the Arabs rejected the United Nations offer of essentially a two-state solution. And um, President Truman going against the advice of a heroic and iconic Secretary of State, George Marshall, recognized Israel uh, 10 or 11 minutes after it declared its independence and immediately gave it uh, legitimacy. Um, really quite, uh, quite remarkable. And I, I mention that history because the relationship between the two countries have been quite strong since then. You know, presidents come and go, prime ministers come and go, they're up, the relations are up or down. But um, to me, the ultimate guarantor of this unique U.S.-Israel relationship is the bipartisan pro-Israel majority in both houses of Congress. And it remains uh, quite strong and quite genuine. And I think it does reflect the feelings of the American people. Um, so <laughs> what happens... Um, how do we advance uh, the pursuit of peace between Israelis and Palestinians? John Kerry, who was, I go all the way back to college with him, although he is a year and a half younger, I must point out, but we were at college together. Um, he's, he's quite sincere in his desire to uh, try to make this work, but it's very hard, and it looks now like it's not going to work, but we never know. Something can happen uh, bef before the end of this month. Um, the, the, the Palestinians, have, first of they're divided into two separate governments, so it's hard to negotiate an agreement for a two-state solution with them because they're, basically they have two states, the West Bank and uh, Gaza. Um, but um, the second is that the, the, the Palestinian leadership has still not been willing to essentially accept the reality of the Jewish state of Israel. And until they do that, it's not going to happen. I mean, Clinton and Barack and Arafat negotiated in 2000 and um, almost had a deal and Arafat walked away. Uh, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert negotiated with Abu Mazen. And incidentally, these negotiations almost always have the same uh, contents to them. Everybody really knows how this is going to end. The question is whether the leaders have the courage to uh, make those decisions. And Abu Mazen walked away from Olmert, and um, unfortunately it looks like uh, Abu Mazen is walking away again because that um, 
that decision to go to the United Nations, to have the United Nations uh, recognize the independent state of Palestine is a declaration that his hopes for the, for the negotiations establishing two states are uh, gone. But, you know, if anybody can, um, uh, miracles uh, are part of the Middle East. So uh, actually there's a wonderful David Ben-Gurion quote, the first prime minister, who said that uh, in Israel, if you don't believe in miracles, you are not a realist. I like that. So, you know, keep our hopes high. Yes, yes sir. Thanks for coming to our university. Can you comment about Edward Snowden and why he shouldn't be protected under our whistleblower laws since he basically exposed the U.S. for spying on all of us? Yeah. So, um, I have a very different view. <laughs> I think he really uh, did extraordinary damage to the U.S. And, um, you know, he, he, had, he had internal ways to do that, but he, he didn't choose to. I mean, I, I don't know that he's so much exposed how we're being spied on as he exposed a lot of elements of our conduct of foreign policy, which have made it very difficult uh, for us uh, both with our allies and with our enemies. So I, I don't have sympathy for him. And uh, I mean, the very fact that he went to Hong Kong and then ended up in Russia makes me uneasy about um, what, um, what really motivated him. I, I don't think he's a hero. Yes. Hi. Um, regarding the current situation in Russia and its potential aggression towards some of the other former Soviet states, um, and also in light of Cold War tensions that may or may not exist, what are your thoughts on the U.S.'s current policy of sort of using an economic strategy towards Russia and then also um, sort of pushing the European Union to act more directly um, in regard to Russian aggression? Yeah. Uh, th this is, a, I mean, this is a tough one to respond to. Um, really, in many ways, uh, the president. Some people say, I think it's possibly partly true that by the president's change of heart about Syria, he invited Putin to assume that if he moved into the Crimea, that there'd be no American um, reaction. What the president had in mind for uh, Syria after he set the red line about chemical weapons was actually much more feasible than uh, uh, dealing with the Crimean situation. In other words, we were going to strike limited military targets, chemical weapons depots, et cetera, to get, make the point. And I have no doubt that the American military could have done that successfully. This is a much more complicated situation. So you have um, Russia invading Ukraine, seizing Crimea. It's the most um, significant sort of compromise of a neighbor's sovereignty since, I suppose, since Saddam Hussein's Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. But how do you respond to it? I mean, no, nobody wants to get into a, a fighting war with Putin over this. Uh, so naturally we go to, and I think the president really appreciates how significant a violation this was by Putin. So how do, you, how do you respond? And I, I do think that the first line of response that the president has taken is the right one, which is economic. Um, and uh, it's critically important, and we'll see how, how strong the backbone is of Europe, that the Europeans be involved in us, with us, because the, the, the economic interactions, relationships between the US and Russia are not insignificant, but they're not really big. There are, there are very significant interactions economically between um, Europe and Russia. And uh, not just in, a lot of it is energy that the Europeans buy but there's, from the Russians, but there's more than that. Also, the other thing here, and this is very personal but not insignificant, as probably a lot of you know, a lot of the Russian oligarchs, the billionaires, um, live most of their lives uh, these days not in uh, Moscow. They live their, most of their lives in London, and mostly London, and some in some of the smaller uh, countries. And 
if the Europeans really were prepared to pull some of their visas and not let them travel like that, most of their families are there, that would have an effect. So I think that's the first response and, and it, it's feasible. Uh, so far, I don't know that we've hurt uh, Putin so much, the, uh, eco I mean, or Russia economically. The second, and this is all um, posturing, but it probably has to be done just to show that we, we should be moving NATO troops, I think, into NATO members that are nearby. So that means Poland, and also that feel threatened. Poland and particularly the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, and we ought to, with the Europeans, be helping or giving assistance to Ukraine, both economically and um, militarily. But I don't, I'm not prepared to predict what Putin will do next. Because um, I think he got away with moving into uh, Georgia in 2008 and Nobody really is contesting what he's doing in Crimea now, and anybody who thinks they're going to negotiate him out of Crimea, boy, he'll really have to be hurt economically for him to do that. Um, yes. Maybe, uh, yes. Thank you for coming, Senator. Uh, we really appreciate it here at the Hofstra community. Um, my question is, you, you were speaking about your first political memory, which was the election in 1952. Yes. My first political memory was in December of 2000 with Bush v. Gore. Ah. And you were discussing with everybody how uh, you looked to Winston Churchill and when you, you lost an election. But the next morning after Bush v. Gore, yeah. when you woke up, how... how how did you how did you do it and, and what there, there was there was there, I mean you could go back to the 1800s and try to see you know the the last time that that happened but yeah. how do you wake up and, and and where do you go from there yeah that's fascinating wow and uh, I probably should have gone to a psychiatrist about this and but this is good therapy and you're not charging me anything um, I, I actually remember exactly what I did I mean I must say that that whole experience was, I don't know, amazing and, and extremely gratifying. I mean, I felt very, very lucky that I was chosen by Vice President Gore. Um, you know, the, the, as you know, the selection by uh, a probable presidential nominee in modern times of, the, of his or her running mate is probably the most unilateral exercise of political power in the American system, which is to say, basically, they can, within limits, they can choose who they want. So the first thing to say is that I'm very grateful to him that, you know, he had the confidence in America and the confidence in me to break a barrier by giving me the uh, extraordinary opportunity and honor to be the first Jewish American on a national ticket. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I look back at it in that sense. I, I don't know that I felt this the day after. But um, the American people couldn't have been more accepting, honestly. There was this, this slight bit of anti-Semitism on the internet after I got nominated, but I didn't find anything but warmth. And, and uh, matter of fact, the Secret Service guys who were with me were, told me that um, one of them, I remember, said he had done four or five national campaigns. He said, I gotta tell you, I've never heard as many people in the crowd say to a, a candidate, God bless you. And he said, I know they're not all Jewish. So uh, they must, they're, they're trying to tell you that though they're a different religion, probably Christian, that they, they feel a bond with you. It was really remarkable. Um, and incidentally, I do want to say, you know, sports is like politics. It comes down to numbers. Forget uh, Bush v. Gore. It, it's a great statement, not about me, but about America, that the ticket on which there was the first Jewish American did get a half a million more votes than the other ticket. So that shows the openness of the American people. So, I mean, as I look back, I felt all that. Uh, when the election uh, night occurred, it was a crazy 36 days after that. Um, and you look back and you say, I wish we had done this, I wish we had done that. But anyway, there, there you are. It, it, it ended in a shocking way to me. I'll never forget when the Florida Supreme Court on Friday essentially ordered the recount in the counties that we asked for it, um, we thought that we had won. And then we were stunned when the Supreme Court uh, accepted the case on Saturday. 
<clears throat> that is accepted that they'd hear arguments, I think, on Monday, or it was very quick. Uh, and when they accepted the, the case, I worried that they were going to make this decision, and they did um, uh, make the decision of Bush v. Gore, which was a very odd decision, made, made me you know, very uh, despairing about the court because I thought it had no business being involved there. But I'll tell you what I did the morning after. I mean, actually, it was, uh, um, we conceded on a Wednesday night. Uh, the decision came down late Tuesday night. And on I was fortunate, really, because I was still in the Senate. And I, I got up early, <laughs> by my nature, and I went to work. <laughs> I went to the Senate. It happened, it was December, but typical of the Congress these days. This will surprise you. We had some sort of budget problem <laughs> going on. And we were still in session. And I went right in, I went to the floor, I made a statement, a kind of concession speech of my own, an expression of gratitude. And, um, you know, I, I actually, uh, for the 12 years that I served, except for the last two, which were so partisan and, and uh, dysfunctional, unproductive, I, I had the most productive years of my Senate career after uh, 2000. So, you know, I'm very grateful for that and to have had that opportunity. Um, obviously, I look back occasionally and say, how did that happen, you know? Uh, but... Um, I was also raised by wonderful parents, and they taught me many lessons. Some may have seemed simple at the time, but they ultimately were profound. And one of them was, um, you never forget tomorrow, but life is about, I'm sorry, you never forget yesterday, but life is about today and tomorrow. And uh, that's ultimately what I, the way I approached uh, the days afterwards. So listen, it's been a, a wonderful opportunity. Thanks to the Sutherland family. Thanks to all of you. All the best.